So I'm Philippa and I work at uh, Peak Lab. Uh, and Jacob was supposed to be here today, but he's didn't. So I, I want to thank him for the opportunity to be here. So I'm going to walk you through how we went from CoffeeScript to, uh, to ECMAScript 6, and how we went from jQuery to Vue.js. And I will also explain you why and how we did it, and what went well on the, on the process, and also what went wrong. And I will share the, the future plans of Frontend with you. So for those of you that did not know what GitLab is, uh, GitLab is an online Git repository manager with a wiki with issues, uh, CI and CD. It is a great way to manage uh, your repositories on a centralized server and gives you completely control of your repositories or projects. You can uh, easily manage uh, if they are public, public or private. And we also offer um, um, enterprise edition with extra feature features for businesses. So you can use GitLab on gitlab.com, which runs enterprise edition, and you can do that for free. Or you can um, install your own instance of GitLab uh, Community Edition also for free, or you can install GitLab Enterprise Edition on uh, your company server. Uh, we are an op a open source project and we all work remotely. So results, efficiency and iteration. Uh, shipping new features while changing tools is a dangerous thing to do. And these are three of our core values. We believe in shipping the smallest iteration possible in cycles of one month. So we don't have time uh, to stop new developing, uh, the developing of new features while changing these tools. And uh, I believe most of you can relate to this problem. Uh, but this, also, this idea also goes against uh, our culture. So, and I can assure you that shipping new features and changing tools at the same time is really good to break things. <laughs> So GitLab started five years ago with this commit, and our CTO Dimitri uh, he started the front end in CoffeeScript, as you would with uh, most Rails applications. And Rails works really well with CoffeeScript, uh, but a lot has happened in the past five years in web development, as you might have noticed. Uh, so we believed that ECMAScript 6 and 7 was the future, and we needed to proactively adopt it. But we had this big problem, uh, everything was in CoffeeScript. So besides following the path uh, to, to the web development, the path that web development was taking uh, by adopting ECMAScript 6 and 7, we also had some other problems to solve with a, with a code base routine uh, in CoffeeScript. So the way Rails organized this CoffeeScript was not ideal for the, the things we wanted to do. And CoffeeScript for, works really well for simple interactions like submitting a form via, uh, via Ajax but uh, UX at GitLab is a little more complex. So, and we also add uh, Ruby helpers and jQuery plugins and our own jQuery code all together. And this mixture was really, really hard to maintain and was also hard to write new features. Uh, we, had, we wanted to have a single source of truth in our code base, just one way of doing things. So, while we were trying to solve all these problems, uh, Babel made it possible to use ECMAScript 6 so it, we decided it was time for a change. And also most of the features we used in CoffeeScript was already covered by ECMAScript 6. Things like uh, string interpolation, classes, default arguments, or error functions. So how did we do it? How did we go from CoffeeScript to ECMAScript 6? So first we looked at uh, how CoffeeScript compiles to ECMAScript 5. And the output is mainly readable ECMAScript 5 with some crazy code in the, in the middle. <coughs> Uh, and we thought that it might be a good idea to take the CoffeeScript we had, compile it to ECMAScript 5, and use that as our code base. And that is, that is what we did. Uh, so one Saturday, while no one was working, we wrote a few ECMAScripts that looked through each CoffeeScript file we had. It, it created a new JavaScript file with the compiled codes, and it then deleted the, the CoffeeScript file. And after several branches and tries, uh, it uh, everything worked perfectly, uh, and we, end up, we ended up with readable ECMAScript 5 with some crazy codes uh, in the middle. But our tests passed, so uh, we were confident. So next, we naturally wanted to write ECMAScript 6. So we added Babel, uh, and this uh, allowed us to use the asset pipeline, and it allowed us to incrementally start to write better codes. And this was the second step of several iterations. 
the, the next step was to start adding in Webpack. And Webpack is part of our master plan uh, to make front end faster, but it was going to be really tricky, especially while uh, shipping new features at the same time. So it took us a month uh, to configure Webpack with our stack. And the reason for this is uh, the GitLab development kit is a Ruby gem uh, that serves that, that runs a search for development and it runs Redis, Red, uh, sorry, it runs Redis and Postgres and the Red servers all at once. Uh, so once uh, we were able to understand how Webpack would work with everything, uh, hopefully without without breaking anything, we were able to put together a merge request. And uh, the switch went smoother than we actually expected, and we were able to change the Rails assets pipeline with Webpack. And in this change, we also uh, switched Teaspoon uh, to Karma Test Runner. And the funny thing is, this is the direction Rails is taking as well. Um, and after this much request, we added several uh, loaders and several plugins uh, in smaller iteration, in smaller merge requests. We still have a lot to do regarding a webpack, but I, I will share that with you in the end. So in the process of changing tools, we, we also added the slit. Uh, eventually, we went from five front-end developers to 17, and it was not easy to have uh, one unique code style, and we also needed to replace uh, coffee links. And for me, one of the greatest things about this merge request in GitLab itself is that the person who did this merge request didn't even work at GitLab at the time, and he made uh, the lives of every front end a lot, a lot easier. And we, we have uh, hired him in the meanwhile. So somewhere along the line, uh, we also switched from our Rails dependency management to NPM and then to Yarn. And the reason why we quickly changed from NPM to YARN is as soon as we added NPM, uh, we added a broke dependency that broke our pipelines. So we quickly learned that we needed to lock versions. And at the time, uh, YARN was uh, the tool to use. So before I explain to you how we went from jQuery to Vue, um, with all these changes, with all these tools, we added some tech depth. Uh, I wanted to share uh, the code with you. So this is what the code used to look like when we had CoffeeScript. And this is a really small component we use across the entire application. And this shows a flash uh, warning for errors. And it's basically uh, a div that accepts a message and it's showed in the same position uh, in all pages. And this is after we, we compiled the code to ECMAScript uh, six, uh, sorry, five. Uh, the, the code doesn't even fit in one screen, but you can see it's, it is readable, atmosphere uh, 5, although it's not our best code. And after we add uh, slint and webpack, this is what the code looks like, uh, and you can see slint is disabled, and uh, the code is attached to the window object. So we know this is not perfect, and we incrementally fix this in, a, in every re release, uh, but this is what allows us to continue shipping things. So while, uh, uh, while all these changes were happening, uh, we started to think how we could make the front ends even easier, even simpler. And we were going through different frameworks and different options, uh, so Jacob wrote a large project in each one uh, to understand how well, how well it would scale and how complex it would be to maintain when the code got a little complex. Uh, so we also looked for the good documentation, questions on Stack Overflow, and that was the general feeling uh, of the community. And of, of all the, the frameworks Jacob tested, Vue was the easiest one to use. So if you, if you look at this tiny example, uh, you can easily understand everything without reading any documentation. Uh, and usually with other tools, this is uh, where it stops being simple. Uh, unlike other tools, uh, Vue, this does not happen with Vue, and Vue real-time usage is as, as simple as this and as simple as stated in the docs. And this is one of the things we really love about Vue. Uh, it has a an elegant combination between uh, structure and simplicity. And documentation is great uh, in Vue. Uh, it is as simple as clear as the tool itself. And not only you can easily understand the technical part of the tool, it also helps you with state management and with code structure. And Vue allows us to write a lot less code at GitLab that we used to uh, when we were using just jQuery. 
And a simple example of this is uh, that, that, that could, uh, a, single, a simple example of code we have in production uh, is an issue at GitLab. An issue as two states is either open or closed, and this is, uh, it, it can change often, and it is visible in a lot of pages. And with jQuery, we had around 30 lines of code to propagate these changes, and it involved several classes and a lot of uh, querying the dot by hand. So with Vue, we have one line of JavaScript and a little bit of HTML. Uh, so the first big feature we wrote in Vue uh, was the issue boards. Uh, Phil took a deep dive into the Vue.js documentation and he created code that is easy to maintain and scale. And we, uh, the, this architecture he implemented, we documented it and we all the all new features are built with this, with this architecture. And the next step was to make things real time. Uh, not long ago, if you use, if you use GitLab, you know this, not, a, not long ago, we had to refresh the page to know if our pipeline had finished or if the merge request was ready to be merged. And this was really unproductive. So when, with backend being ready for real time, we needed to guarantee the front end was going to be responsive enough to update the data and it's going to be performance. And this is where Vue 2 really shines. So we wrote uh, our, some of our existing codes uh, in Vue.js and created a simple function for pulling data that we reuse uh, everywhere we have, we have real time. And although we improved uh, UX a lot and our code is much, much better now, in this process, we also introduced some new technical depth. Uh, because we did not create as much reusable components as you used to, and not all our features followed the same architecture. And this is where we knew, we knew that we needed to create documentation on how to write Vue at GitLab. So we wrote uh, when and why we should use Vue and how to, how to do it. So we keep improving the old features, but we also keep improving the documentation itself. And in the meanwhile, we were able to also move to Vue.js and to Vue files, and this also required a little bit of rewriting things. So how do we use Vue.js at GitLab? Uh, we don't plan to rewrite everything we have uh, already in Vue, and not all new features are going to be in Vue. So instead of that, we have small uh, Vue applications that are similar to small single page applications. And this is the architecture we decided for our view applications. We basically have a main view component. We have a, s a service that allows us to communicate with the, with the server to, to get data. And we have a store that holds that data uh, that we receive from the server. So let's see this by looking at a little bit of code. Um, we're starting by adding uh, an element to the view that is going to be loaded. And we tell Webpack where to look for the JavaScript. And as you might have noticed, we have a lot of uh, data attributes in that element. And this is because we still have information we only have in runs, and like uh, paths and endpoints, and this is how we, we provide that information to our view application. The next step is to create a bundle file. And the bundle file uh, in GitLab with this architecture is basically the index file of our view application, uh, where we actually mount the components. So we, we import it and we we mounted in the, the element we previously created. And next, we need to create a store so we have a place to, or, to hold uh, the data. And our stores are simple classes. They used to be objects, but as time went on, we decided it's better to have a, a class that we can instantiate and always have the same data at that given point. And the next step is the service. Um, this is what we use to communicate to the API. We are currently using Vue resource, but uh, from time to time we, we talk about changing it because um, this architecture is great not only for Vue components, but uh, for other features we are adding in, uh, and we would like to be able to use the same tool for everything. And the next step is to create our main component when we bind everything together. So as soon as the component is created, we make a call to the service and if everything go well, goes well, if the response uh, is successful, we tell the store to hold the data and to use it. And uh, if things were wrong, we, we warn the user about it. Uh, and usually we have smaller components in each, in each our view application, uh, because not only we can reuse them, but our files are, are also more readable if we don't have everything in one file. So this is, this is basically the data flow and structure uh, I just showed you. 
Uh, it is super simple and it is uh, easy to maintain and scale, even if we need to add more, more stuff to, to our view. But the trickier part comes when we have uh, parts of GitLab that we can rewrite all uh, in, one, in one release. Some parts will be enamel, some parts will be jQuery, some parts will be view. So for those scenarios, we create even smaller view applications. So for example, in the pipeline's detail page, only the graph and the header are view, and it's because they are the only parts that have real-time data. And if we did uh, apply the, the architecture I just mentioned you, we were going to be fetching data from two inputs and pulling two inputs, and that was not a good idea. So we, we create a mediator uh, that allows us to share the, the same data between the two of them with just one one point call. Uh, we, and this also allows us to reduce a lot of duplicated code between them. Um, so in our bundle file, we instantiate the mediator, we make the request to the server, and we create our two view applications that share the same, the same store, the same servers, and the same data. And this is what the, our architecture looks like on those cases. Uh, the great thing about this is that we can usually transform this mediator in a main view component once we have the, the power to change the whole view into Vue.js. And they will not require a lot of restructuring because the header and the graph are already uh, smaller components that do not know about the service, so it, it, it will be easy to change. So, how do we test all, the, all these codes? Uh, the, the smaller reusable components, the, the ones that do not know about the service in the store, those are the easiest to test, and we mostly follow, follow the view documentation for this. So we import our components, and since it is um, an object, we, we use the extend, the extend function, and before we mount the component, uh, before each test, we mount it, and after we, we destroy it. And we mostly test the rendered outputs but if uh, our methods or computed properties are too complex, then we test them directly instead of testing the, the rendered output instead. And for the main components, we need to mock the API requests. And with jQuery, we would spy on the global AJAX objects, uh, but with view resource, we take advantage of the interceptors. So we create an interceptor, we push it, and we make sure to remove it after. <laughs> and this allows us not to test only the the, the rendered output, but how the, the component actually works with the store and the service. But we do have some challenges. Uh, we still have some problems to solve. Uh, for example, what's the best, best approach to use jQuery uh, bootstrap with our components, uh, with our view components? So when we added real time to the pipelines table, we would often see some problems with the tooltip. Uh, although we were receiving new data and view was updating accordingly, the tooltip was showing all data and it gets stuck there forever. So the solution we found at the time was to create a mixin based on the reference, and every time the component would update, we would update that mixin. And at the time, this was really handy, but recently we learned that this solution does not scale. We cannot have one, um, more than one tooltip uh, in, uh, in the components, and this is really obvious now, but it wasn't at the time. Uh, so this is one of our challenges, uh, is to understand how we make jQuery Bootstrap work with, um, not only jQuery Bootstrap, but also other jQuery plugins with, uh, work with few, few components. Do we use a wrapper for them? Will the will a mix in be enough? So we are going case by case uh, to understand what is best. So we still have a lot to do regarding view. Uh, the next step is to make sure all of you could, uh, all all of uh, the the view code we have looks the same and is well organized. Um, the new view code follows the, the architecture I, I just showed you, but the old one does not. Uh, and then other, another thing we need to do is to have only view files. Uh, the old ones are still JavaScript files. And we also need to create more reusable components. Uh, because we added all these new features in Vue at the same time, we ended up with a lot of repeated code in Vue that we can reuse between views. And we will eventually need a linter. Uh, Vue is currently the only part of our code that does not have a linter, although we created a style guide for, a style guide for using Vue. And we are currently experimenting adding Vuex to, to our stack to see 
uh, if it will if it would help us to more complex areas of our code. So, uh, what does the, the future look like for our front-end team at GitLab? Uh, most of these plans are already a work in progress. Um, our main goal is to, to iterate fast on features. So, this means that we spend most of our time working in new features instead of working in tools. And, well, in a perfect world, we would uh, have all, all, of this, all of these things already done. Um, we need to divide our time accordingly. So our objective is to make our code as fast as possible and we have identified the, the, the places where we have the poorest performance and we are working on them. And now that we have Webpack, uh, we are able to, to, to go to code splitting and asynchronously load launch, launch components so we can remove the code from the window object and import only the functions we need where we need them. And the plan is to to divide the code and load them in page specific chains instead of loading it all at once. And we, we, we will have more places with real time, uh, which means we will have more view codes. Uh, the plans include having the sidebar and merge requests and issues in, in real time. And we are working on responsive tables to be able to have a usable interface in mobile phones or smaller screens. And we also would like to load CSS to wrap back. Currently, we are still using the assets pipeline to do this. Um, it is an, an our plans to do that through our bank. And um, accessibility is also one of the, our top priorities. We wanted to make it uh, completely uh, accessible. accessible. Uh, it is not at the moment. And as I mentioned before, we are um, working on a solution to have a better uh, state management in view. And we are also replacing PhantomJS with uh, Atlas Chrome, not only because Phantom won't be maintained, but because we also have some problems uh, using Phantom with our RSpec integration tests. So, uh, as I said, uh, GitLab is an open source project, uh, which means everyone can contribute. So if you would like to be part of, of GitLab and help us make it better, uh, you can help us either by posing issues, we, you can look for accepting, la uh, accepting merge requests label, or if you have a suggestion or feedback for us, please use our issues. Feel free to create one if there isn't one already. You can bring anyone from, from the GitLab team in, in the, the issues to help you. Everyone will be happy to help you. Uh, questions? <laughs>